Good afternoon, and thank you for joining. This is Mike Green. I'm Senior Director of the Life Science Group within uh, UiPath. Accompanying me on today's webinar is Arvind Mamadani. He is the Senior VP of Life Science at the Insidio, one of uh, UiPath's partners. They were going to give you a group discussion on the success adoption of UiPath and life sciences. We're also going to give you a quick demo on the platform to sort of introduce you to those of you who haven't seen it, how the automation works. I'd like to start by first introducing a new mindset, one of which automate, we call automation first, a mindset of everyone should at some point here in the near future have a robot on their desktop. But first a bit about some of the advancements in the area of robotic automation for many of us this will mean and what what this automation will mean is a huge performance uh, improvement and opportunities when i say automation a lot of people typically think of stuff uh, around the factory floor or logistics operation but these are not the forms of automation that i'm referring to i'm talking about automation of the knowledge worker what this applies to are the folks in an organization that spend almost all of their time in the digital domain. They're primarily executing and running processes. Their days uh, are spent extracting and cleansing data, building reports, running analytics, making decisions, and spending a large amount of time solving issues and fighting fires. Up until now, we've largely avoided automation because of the complexity and the risk that these tasks bear. Today's technology has changed things. Today's technology and automation capabilities extend up the value chain to the automation of inputs and process, entry of data into statistical databases, monitoring protocol compliances, <clears throat> excuse me, checking data quality to the completion of a study, and submitting uh, data to regulatory and qualifying uh, anomalies and, and designing data collection methods. All this can be done using the UiPath RPA platform in our ecosystem, creating a new mindset that will drive digital transformation, which is what we're now calling and refer to as the future as automation first. The value to the pharmaceutical companies is the traditional approach has been in process automation. The repetitive, manual, highly structural, logical data, things such as processing emails and invoices. A lot of this automation we visit with our clients are seeing can be oh, as much as 20 to 25% of their daily process. So by automating these you are able to capture savings you're able to optimize processes but that's only a part of the value chain as we extend up the value chain to into cognitive automation we're looking at not only the repetitive manual but the situational and decision oriented capabilities where we extend beyond just the capabilities of processing standard workflows, but into more complex workflows. A network is cobbled, cobbled together cognitive tools like machine learning, natural language processing, conversational AI, and analytics are enabling more advanced research and new uh, products, accelerating drug development, driving compliance in clinical trials, and improving the clinical site selection and accelerating uh, areas such as patient identification. The applicability of all of this technology applies across the entire value chain in pharma. We're seeing it in basic research, manufacturing and supply chain, regulatory and sales and marketing. What we're going to show you here briefly is, is an example of robotics. We have a quick little demo where we're going to show you the box in process. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Arvind, who will walk you through a deeper dive. Arvind, can we run the video?
Traditional patient safety narrative writing is a manual and time consuming process marked by long wait times and cross functional dependencies resulting in inefficiencies. Manual data intake process making scalability difficult. In compliant format of files ready for publishing and output dependent on writing skills of the medical writer leading to inconsistencies. In CEDO's automated patient narrative draft creation shrinks the 4 to 8 weeks draft preparation time to 4 to 6 hours while assuring 100% accuracy. Delivering a pre-filled patient safety narrative template that acts as a starting point for the medical writers under a week's time, intelligently maps different document sources and summarizes and includes complex business rules into the narrative. Upon initiation, bot reads the intake documents and extracts the desired information. The bot reopens the CRF to validate the extracted information. And populates the patient safety narrative template. Finally, the bot saves the output file at a desired location. Final output is a draft of the narrative that becomes a new starting point for the writer. Implementation of Incedo's intelligent automation solution for patient safety narrative writing process results into shrinking narrative preparation timelines from several weeks to just days. Process increasing volumes efficiently. Optimized use of PV resources and time. Supporting compliance of both traditional and new safety sources with accuracy. Okay, great. Uh, so this is Arvind from NCDO. So that was a, a quick demonstration of one of the use cases uh, that you see within the uh, patient safety value chain. So uh, before we kind of go a little deeper, I wanted to take a minute and describe uh, what we think of as uh, intelligent automation in this landscape. For us, there are two classes of capabilities that uh, come to mind. One is uh, approaches that you take to automate what you already have, you know, whether it is um, repetitive tasks that you have within your business processes. Typically, you think of RPA in that sense. Uh, business process orchestration, uh, to streamline what you have, and connecting your disconnected data silos, you know, using an API-led approach to make that happen. That really gives you a level of efficiency on uh, what you already have in play. You complement that with a set of capabilities that allows you to improve decision-making, which is where we think of analytics, um, whether it is analytics to simply get insights into what you have or using machine learning approaches to get a little more uh, predictive insights into what could occur uh, as a result of what you've seen in the past and other such scenarios. The fourth element that we see is really um, cognitive capabilities. And here cognitive to us is uh, the, um, the functions that are performed by human beings, the, uh, the cognitive approaches they take intuitively. You know, how do you reduce the burden of that as your workloads increase and you have to handle a variety of different tasks. You know, how can you use, uh, you know, technologies, whether it is natural language processing and other capabilities out there to help reduce the cognitive burden. The combination of these two really represents what is intelligent automation uh, for us in this landscape. Now, what I will do is um, take you through how you get started. So if you think about the starting point of a, a framework for execution, 
there are three things that we look into. You know, what problem do you want to solve? And as a result of solving that problem, what is the, you know, the the business impact that you're creating that often translates into a, a key performance indicator that you will drive into? And what are then your building blocks of capabilities? You know, what is your automation strategy? What is the platform you use? What is your strategy around data and security uh, and the pieces that come together? Now, when you think about what problem to solve, oftentimes what we find is very intuitively, um, you know, one kind of looks into a particular problem uh, within what they do, very easy to fix, quick fixes that allows you to kind of gain the benefit of automation. Um, absolutely nothing wrong with that kind of an approach, but often what we see is then your ability to scale beyond that initial proof point is uh, uh, challenging. So what we recommend then uh, is to look at the problem to solve with the lens of the the business process of the area and the entire value chain that you want to impact. What you see on the page here is an example of uh, uh, patient safety or pharmacovigilance, you know, the process of collection, collation, and evaluation of adverse events to improve drug safety and kind of increase access to medicines. So when you look at that path end to end, then you look at what are the intervention points within this value chain that can actually benefit from automation, and then lay down the rest of the steps, which includes what is the metric you're impacting, as well as the, uh, the key automation platform that you want to build this upon. I'm going to use this particular example for the rest of the session so that we can do a double click and kind of go a step deeper. So let's take a closer look. Uh, I'll spend a minute on KPIs again. I can't overemphasize perhaps the importance of having a very clear view into what is that metric that you'd like to impact as a result of an automation initiative. And what we find is these uh, sh ideally should not be your operational metrics or administrative metrics, but a metric that uh, business stakeholders within that particular process area function also relate to. And as a result, then you're thinking about how much you're moving the needle and what is the process change or the process impact you want to drive and how does automation kind of fit into this picture. Uh, an anecdotal example that I can offer here is uh, with a biologic that we have worked, um, implementing a, a risk evaluation uh, strategy program, a REMS program, then translated into what are the risk profiles that um, one wanted to impact within the PV function. And the metrics then translated into what are the activities that you execute and what are the intervention points as a result. So what you see here on the page are illustrative examples. Within your own organization, you may have a different way of tracking it. The, um, uh, the, uh, the important thing here is really to think about what is that metric and having a very clear common definition of that uh, to drive the rest of the process. This oftentimes allows you to kind of bridge the gap between, you know, what a business goal is and how the uh, IT or the technology implementation often uh, leads into. So once you have this, then you uh, think about where you are um, in your uh, journey when it uh, comes to the automation as a landscape itself. Now, we think of this as a continuum, and the continuum depends one on the uh, the maturity level of the organization, but more importantly around what are your business priorities. If you look at this uh, from left to right, you, know, you think about basic automation uh, using the example of the safety value chain. You can think about um, automating certain workflows, automating certain collection elements, and often looking at you know reports that you can automate. Then you can take the next step of process automation, which essentially is external feeds, data that's coming in, you know, how can I kind of improve that function? Cognitive automation is taking the next step in terms of, uh, uh, you know, helping improve the uh, the cognitive uh, burden on the individual performing the function. The, the video demonstration that you saw was an example of a patient narrative, and can we create a more intelligent starting point for that patient narrative and kind of reducing the burden of the uh, you know, kind of the first mile set of activities one typically goes through. And then ultimately looking at, you know, really using a machine learning type of a technique or other advanced techniques to 
make that as a, a virtual continual cycle in terms of how you can improve. So the key thing here is to really think about you know where you are in this journey, what type of a problem are you looking to solve? Uh, do you have a good view of the bigger picture? What is the metric that you'd like to impact? And do you have a sense of how the ROI is going to be impacted as a result? Once you have this in play, within the value chain of patient safety, there are several automation opportunities that you can then um, look into, particularly with a view of uh, identifying which ones will have that impact. So what you see here are you know, at least seven different intervention points, um, you know, starting from case intake to the initial triage of the narrative to the review process before you close out, all the way to your signal detection uh, type of an activity where you can uh, identify opportunities for automation. When you think about the, the bottom half on the page, which is what I call as the administrative activities, oftentimes what we find is this is uh, this usually is the starting point for many who are kind of uh, initiating the uh, automation journey. Uh, this, you know, things around data entry, things around reconciliation, if you have multiple um, partners that you work with for extracting and integrating feeds. Uh, those typically are, I would say, the low-hanging fruits, uh, if you think about them to uh, start out with. Um, the only uh, learning and recommendation as a result we have is um, start with them, but start with them in the context of the bigger picture that you'd like to impact. We have seen that to be successful, and we've also seen situations where you start with that as an activity, it creates the impact, but not at a level that you can scale that initiative beyond, beyond the initial proof point. So with this as a view, then you start applying a, a technology lens to this picture and say, okay, what is the right um, type of a platform? What are the key components of a platform that you should be looking for in order to implement such an initiative? And for us, the um, evaluation of what I call is the ideal platform considerations, um, using this example, is really to think about a platform that is multipurpose. And by that, what I mean is not individual discrete applications that you build out, but a platform that allows you to you know, take an example of a process that you would like to implement, but also allows you to scale uh, into other process areas as you need to. So the flexibility is a key uh, element of consideration when you think of a platform. Then you think about you know uh, opportunities, areas, how you can use the platform for ingestion, integration that needs to take in place, and the best-in-class analytics. What you see here is a conceptual view of a, a, a patient safety platform in this example, which starts all the way from uh, intake to uh, execution to the downward reporting with a variety of different sources. Um, and what we find particularly in the area of patient safety in this example is um, at least 10 to 20 percent year over year, the, the volume of adverse events. Uh, beyond your traditional sources, you have new sources of uh, adverse event intake that comes in. Then you're really thinking about the future, not so much in terms of um, uh, operating efficiencies alone in that context. So once you have a mental model, uh, a blueprint of what your platform considerations are, then you start mapping them into what is a good product or a platform out there that kind of complements these capabilities. Um, and certainly UiPath that we have worked with uh, quite extensively in this space, you know, kind of uh, puts a check mark on many of these boxes, um, particularly with an emphasis around uh, the flexibility of the architecture that allows you to kind of integrate different pieces of your assets within the organization. Now, once you have the broader execution framework, starting with the value chain, start figuring out what your key performance indicator or the metric that you would like to impact with, breaking that down into where you see opportunity for what type of an automation to implement to drive out uh, that efficiency, picking out a platform that makes the most sense. To state the obvious, it really then comes down to execution. Um, this is, uh, we have found, a not a trivial exercise. Um, it is important 
to really think about the, the bigger picture. Start small, certainly with one or two uh, processes that you would like, but really have the bigger picture in mind saying, if you were successful in delivering that proof point, are you in a position to then scale um, as fast as you can? And that really then comes down to uh, you know, the broader initiative that you have in terms of uh, realizing the value of uh, automation itself. So we looked at patient safety as uh, a set of examples today, uh, again with a framework of what a blueprint uh, could look like, you know, starting with uh, uh, the picture of the value chain to the key building blocks to the key performance indicators you impact, all the way down to uh, the selection of the right platform and the execution model. We, however, see several such opportunities um, that exist across other parts of the life sciences value chain itself. And you know some of them are listed out here on this page. Um, and what you will find is, uh, as you think about any of these functions, the the way to create impact is to have that kind of a uh, an end-to-end -end blueprint model, and then really looking for specific opportunities within that to um, create the right level of impact. And before uh, I kind of open up for questions, I want to recap some of our uh, learnings and best practices that we have seen are key to implement the right kind of an automation initiative. Um, seven of them, as you can see, um, one is to design an end-to-end -end program that's not in silo, um, so which means you're not looking at processes in isolation. Um, look at that as an end-to-end -end program, uh, both from a functional perspective as well as a technology perspective. You know, start with the overall process design, but really look for opportunities that allows you to demonstrate uh, a value of an initiative like this. So the kind of the, the fixes to the broken processes and how do you prioritize them is key. Focus on the business outcome uh, and the impact tracking around what are the metrics that you will impact, not necessarily your administrative or operational metrics. Um, it is not just a business initiative. It is not just a technology or an IT initiative. It's really a initiative that needs to bring business and IT together in order for this to be successful. Um, data quality is key. Uh, ultimately, as a result of being able to orchestrate, automate, and connect everything together, the uh, end result of it is largely dependent on the quality of the source data, as well as given the uh, the industry space we are in, the um, uh, the security considerations you need to put in play to um, realize that value. We see that this is a um, a business transformation initiative and not necessarily a technology only program. So to that end, um, enabling alignment across your cross-functional team, across your leadership team is key in order for this to um, sustain and scale beyond the initial proof points that you may be looking for. And uh, lastly, you know, have a good governance model, which essentially brings together uh, different functions of operations, IT, finance, and HR together. Um, so those are um, you know, some of our learnings from uh, what we have seen is what a success model looks like and um, what are key as a result of best practices to kind of realize the full value of automation. So with that, I'll take a, a pause, and um, I'd love to open up for questions. Well, one of the questions that we've uh, received is, uh, how do you assess if the new way execution through this automation is truly better than what you current uh, what's currently in use? Great. So let me take that mic, and maybe you can add to it if you like. So one of the ways that we have uh, 
sound and in a very practical way uh, to think about uh, uh, evaluating a new automation approach versus what you may already have is, you know, think of an A-B test where you can essentially create a sandbox environment. If you have a certain process that you execute to today, you know, create a sandbox of that environment as a small subset and apply an automation uh, proof point on that sandbox. And then you can compare the two. You know, how you do today versus how the uh, the new model looks like um, within that sandbox, which allows you to very quickly and very um, efficiently kind of compare the the differences and the benefit between the two. Okay, Arvind, another question that has come in is if we look at uh, your uh, automation continuum, we currently have multiple methods of basic automation already in place. So is RPA for targeting areas only beyond them? Okay, sure. So I think if you take um, an example of a basic automation, uh, again, let's say we use the example of patient safety that we all reviewed, you know, typically what you would find are uh, you may have a SaaS product in place, which are writing your custom scripts to kind of create the uh, automation that you may be looking for. Um, what we find is when you apply um, a, an automation platform, RPA, whether it is UiPath or other choices you look at, it's really about um, creating an automation technique which is less dependent on uh, programming, right? So what is considered as low code, it allows you to essentially use a, uh, a very configurable, very visual design to define what your automation techniques need to be, very simple scripts that you can manage to, and the ease with which you can um, replicate uh, what you may essentially use very intense programming techniques for. So we do see opportunities even in basic automation for you to use a tool like RPA and kind of benefit from that uh, a lot more uh, quickly. Okay, okay Arvin, we have a, uh, another question. Even though a holistic approach is important and desired, it seems like there is a lot of value in just automating broken or repetitive processes. Can you comment? Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, and Mike, um, feel free to uh, chime in as you see this. So what we see is uh, that really would be your starting point. You know, When you look at a process that is repetitive and broken, yes, absolutely fix it make that happen. Um, looking at the, the process as a whole uh, allows one to create a more substantial business case within the organization, uh, which can then go beyond a few um, you know, minimal investments that you may take to essentially uh, create automation within those broken pieces. But then once you're there, um, how do you scale this and how do you sustain this? That's where we see looking at an end-to-end -end view, uh, not necessarily to build out such a view, but having that big picture in mind allows you to take advantage of, once I have done these um, you know, basic hygiene, which you anyway need to do, uh, how can we build further on that? And Mike, there's another question, uh, if you'd like to take this on. Uh, for RPA, sometimes the benefits of efficiency is significantly less than the cost to stand up the bot. Do we continue the journey? Any advice on how to get the most benefits from RPA? That's a good question. And quite honestly, uh, 
perhaps maybe we need to look at the processes and the roles that you've got the bots playing. It's, you know, the common use of the bots is to eliminate or replace or mimic those mundane, repetitive uh, tasks that humans are doing. And studies have shown that a bot will operate those high volume mundane tasks at a rate of 15 to one. Um, and, and that is a lot of times in, in the back office. So uh, I think it, there's a way of setting priorities as to which processes you want to target, uh, where they add the best value. Uh, I don't think uh, every process that's out there is going to uh, be a target, uh, but we can assist our customers and, you know, uh, taking a look at those that are uh, the right fit, that have the right, right, can have the right priority have the right uh, uh, business value as a payback. Great, I believe we yes. have another one. Um... Yeah, the uh, looks like one came in, while IT and the business should uh, partner on automation efforts. Is this a platform that the business can manage and build out the automation with limited to no IT involvement? Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion around that, and there is, to be transparent, there's a, a lot of truth on both ends. The, the platform uh, and, and the ability to develop uh, bots has gone uh, to a much higher level of, of ease of use. It no longer requires a, a great degree of uh, coding and uh, software uh, coding uh, skills. It's uh, much more driven by process flow, uh, the ability to use uh, flow charts, um, and there are other tools, uh, for example, in our platform, such as the recorder that, that capture the keystrokes of a user uh, so there's ways of uh, allowing the citizen developers, we refer them to, begin the process. Uh, but I, it, as you move up the value chain, as you move into more complex workflows and so forth, it, it, it definitely makes sense to either engage a subject matter expert or a developer who can assist with the uh, exception handling and error handling and so forth uh, before you put some of these systems uh, into production. So it's... Uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a a relationship between the two, uh, but you know there's a lot of our clients that are starting uh, to adopt the uh, citizen development model uh, to actually do some preliminary identification, testing, evaluation of the process, and then taking it to their uh, IT organization, which typically is the uh, group that owns the. Uh, uh, the subject matter uh, or the developers and so forth to put uh, systems up and into production. Right, and Mike, if I can uh, add something to that, the um, the platform itself is very um, business friendly in the sense that it is uh, very visual, user interface driven, allows you to set up your workflows, configure with some level of support that you may need for any complex scripting. Um, where we see the IT involvement largely um, uh, comes in is uh, when you think about data sources that you need to integrate with uh, and connect with in order for your business process or your function to work effectively. So they may at times be disconnected. They may at times require a little bit of uh, uh, heavy lifting from uh, the IT organization in order for you to realize that into your workflow. So that would be an example of a situation where we see um, the, you know, the handshake occur. The broader point here is to say that um, even if it is not so much as the uh, IT teams implementing or building it, you know, having them as part of the, uh, the journey really helps solve these bottlenecks up front. Yeah, and I'll say that you know the and we when my answer typically is one that focuses on just the development piece, but the uh, the ongoing uh, governance piece, uh, scale, ability, management, uh, 
the scheduling of bots and processes, uh, that skill set uh, typically uh, goes to uh, an IT function where uh, clients will have a strong governance group or center of excellence uh, that have oversight uh, in those areas. Someone went on with a follow-on question, was under the impression that RPA would uh, not fix a broken process, but rather it is advisable to have a solid process. Well, yes, you don't go out and automate a process if it's broke. Uh, fully agree. Uh, it doesn't fix broken processes. Uh, what we would suggest is it's an opportunity for you to reassess a process, fix it, optimize it, and then automate it. Uh, automating it isn't going to fix the problem. Right. And um, uh, what we really mean by fixing broken processes is what is the reason that process is broken? Um, if the process design itself has gaps, uh, certainly we'll need to revisit that. But often we find there are uh, uh, manual intervention points, you know, things that are slowing down the process itself or things that are being done in a way where uh, there are multiple steps to get to that uh, uh, endpoint, uh, which to us are not necessarily a, a reinvention or a uh, um, re-engineering of the entire process, um, but we see those as opportunities where by streamlining and to some extent automating, we can uh, fix those broken areas. question that came in, are there companies that you can share that have had a lot of great success to realize full value of automation and how long did it take for them to get to a steady state? Uh, sure. Um, so I, without naming individual companies, you know, uh, for um, I would say a top 20 uh, pharmaceutical company, the uh, example that you uh, we just showed you in this session, which was around uh, impacting the, the patient safety pharmacovigilance function, um, first it took us about first 90 days to um, get a base platform that allows you to uh, ingest, automate, uh, and integrate your intake all the way into your downstream systems. And then you start implementing, um, you know, kind of your advanced analytics on top, which took us another, uh, I would say, three months. However, within the first four weeks, um, you see benefits of, uh, um, you know, kind of what I call the low-hanging fruits, you know, opportunities within that value chain where you can uh, implement automation opportunities and uh, see the value. So if you look at it as a roadmap, it's, uh, within four weeks, you should start seeing the benefits. Scale that out within the first 90 days to have a full platform in play, and scale that out another 90 days to essentially have the benefits of uh, uh, cognitive and analytics complementing that overall function. And there are several such examples. Uh, uh, Mike, I'm sure you can add others too. Yeah, there's a lot of companies that will start with the uh, inner department and then department wide. Uh, the uh, they'll s spread out uh, to eventually across the enterprise, and it is a journey that uh, that uh, we we see them take, uh, especially in the pharmaceutical and the biotech uh, areas where there's uh, a lot of uh, regulations and uh, concerns around compliance. Um, so the adoption is quick to happen in the financial area, for example, quick in a procurement, um, back office, call center with uh, conversational voice bots and so forth. Um, those adoption rates are very quick. Uh, but as you move across the value chain uh, into the uh, other areas, uh, they move a little bit slower, but uh, it, the, uh, we do see a constant progression. Uh, some of our clients are starting to now mandate from senior leadership a percentage of our processes be automated. One of the pharma clients, a global uh, pharma CEO, has stated that he wants to see a 40% of uh, process automation in place by 2000, I think, in 25. 
which is an aggressive number. Um, so it takes the senior leadership, I think, to drive this kind of a change in adoption. Uh, but uh, it, it, it is it is it is uh, happening very broad across most of our clients. They wait in, and then as they build momentum, it just it it, it accelerates. Okay, well, I think we can wrap up. Um, if there are, uh, are any additional questions, uh, I believe uh, contact details uh, will be uh, provided to you. Uh, feel free to reach out to uh, myself or Arvin. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, uh, taking the time uh, to participate in our discussion this afternoon. Hopefully, you got some insights out of it, and we look forward to uh, following up with those of you that have uh, additional questions. Thank you. Arvin, you have anything you want to add?